I'm Jake Bruton with Aero Building, and today on the Build Show Network, I'm going to talk to you about an air source heat pump that isn't running my HVAC system. So before we get to the surprise of what that outdoor unit is doing, I want to give you a hint by talking about water heating. And I want to talk about water heating in the sense of residential in the United States. I think that it's one of the things that we think about as a consumer, as a homeowner, and even as a builder or a plumber sometime, as it's just, it's no different than a garbage disposal. It does what it does. If we wanna spend a little bit more money, we can get one that's quieter or a little bit more efficient. But no one special orders a garbage disposal. You go to the store, and you buy what they have, and that's what you install. And the same thing happens for water heating in the United States, which is kind of weird when you think about, we don't just buy the windows off the shelf most of the time. We don't just buy the siding off the shelf. We don't just buy whatever they have in stock or look at the two things that, that the box store has and then go, okay, well, that one's more bang for our buck or, hey, we're gonna save a little bit of money. Let's buy that one. We don't treat a lot of the things inside of our house that way. So why do we treat heating water that way? I'm not sure. I think that we choose to view it as a first cost only item. Meaning, when it comes to talking about how we're gonna heat the water inside of our house, the conversation starts with, what does the unit cost? That's it. Not what is the operating cost, what is the installation cost, what is the long-term durability. If you've ever noticed, uh, especially in a rental property, the water heater will have a date handwritten on it by whoever installed it. That's because that thing is a time bomb. And I don't mean bomb in the sense of a bomb. I mean that thing, it, it has a, a limited lifespan and we just acknowledge that when we install a new one. We would never just accept that from any other devices. We would never buy a stove and write the installation date on the back of it so that we can know, hey, this thing's about dead. But for some reason, we accept that when it comes to heating water in the United States. So let's talk about the traditional methods that we're using to heat water. For the purpose of our conversation, we're gonna kind of just set aside solar hot water and just say it's very expensive it's not widespread and uh, we haven't we haven't encountered it yet in a way that we thought was uh, a good value for the client so we'll just push that aside for the moment we're going to talk today about gas and electric so if you have a gas water heater you have a uh, heating element that pokes into the tank of the water that's effectively the same thing as your toaster the heating element gets really hot it causes the water around it to get hot and then that water can be piped to where you want it. If you have a gas water heater, you have a heating element below the tank, it heats the tank, the same as a pot of water on the stove, uh, and then that water can be piped wherever you want it. And when we're talking about efficiency ratings, uh, setting aside the uh, DOE's measure, we'll just talk about percentages because that system to me makes more sense. Electric heating, that, that resistance heating that we were talking about, if you put a dollar's worth of electricity into resistance heating, you get 80 to 90% of that uh, energy back. Uh, meaning that you're gonna get eight, eight, 80 cents worth of hot water out of that tank. Uh, gas can be substantially higher. I think I've seen some gas water heaters as high as like uh, 99% but that unit is still not going to be returning more value in hot water than what you put into it. Now, when we talk about electric, we also can then add on uh, heat pump, air source heat pump. So it's the exact same thing that your refrigerator does in reverse. It compresses a gas, it lets it go, it steals the, steals the thermal energy off of it and dumps it into the hot water or dumps it into the water to make it hot. Those systems can be in the 200% range. So meaning you put $1 in, you get $2 worth of uh, heated water back. And then the third, uh, or the, the, the other way that we traditionally see hot water nowadays in the United States that uh, a lot of people are on the bandwagon with is tankless. Now, 
it still takes the same amount of BTUs to heat each liter of water or each measure of water. The difference that gives tankless a higher efficiency is that it's not keeping any water warm throughout the day. So it has no tank loss. Uh, so it heats the water as it goes through a small line assembly and on to you. And we're not heating any water that we're not gonna use right now. That's great for efficiency standpoints, uh, but don't be tricked into thinking that it's a more efficient way of heating water. It's just a more efficient way of handling that hot water. So I think we should look at it that way. And those systems have some downsides just like any other. Uh, the the regularly scheduled maintenance on those can be a little bit of a challenge for some home, homeowners, uh, whereas like an electric resistance heater is uh, set it and forget it. You know, we're, we're not gonna touch that unit. So we're here at our Spring Valley house. I'm sure that you recognize this house by now. And uh, this house is combustion free. The reason this house is combustion free is we believe that electricity will become cheaper as solar and renewables become more popular. This house is set up so that a couple years after occupancy, we have the load calculations and we will have solar here. So this, this house should be net zero by that time. And when it comes to indoor air quality concerns, burning fossil fuels inside the house is probably not the best idea. Doesn't mean that it's exactly dangerous. It's just, you know, we weren't gonna have a cooktop and a hood because just because the cooktop's turned on doesn't mean the hood's turned on. Doesn't mean that you're getting rid of the nasty things that are generated by that unit. We don't want things like a cooktop anymore. We're driving our clients towards a combustion-free house. We believe that the future is combustion free. So that leads you to, that, that eliminates a gas water heater and an on-demand gas water heater. That leads you to probably in a house with R40 walls, R9 windows, and R60 insulation in the attic, uh, a heat pump water heater. Well, there are some downsides to a heat pump water heater on a house like this. First of all, this house has very low air leakage numbers, 0.3 ACH50. And for us to have those air leakage numbers and a heat pump water heater indoors, that unit is constantly putting off cold air. Well, part of the year, that's a bonus. We get free air conditioning from that. I mean, obviously not free, but we get a side benefit of air conditioning. But in climate zone four, we are predominantly heating. Sometimes it seems counterintuitive, but we have more heating degree days than we have cooling. That means that now we're battling our hot water heater because we have a heat pump water heater. So that's a downside. That's the first downside to a heat pump water heater. The second downside is it doesn't just fit in a small space. It has to be thermally connected to 700 square feet or roughly. There's some different rules for different units. So if I have a water heater that needs 700 square feet of space, uh, actually I think it might be 700 cubic square or cubic feet of space, that's a large volume. So it either has to be in a big room, which nobody's doing, or that room has to be ducted or uh, a vented door or something like that to allow it to share volume. Uh, it needs enough area to steal heat from, in other words. Well, that means that that duct work, that open door, that uh, vented door are going to allow the noise from that water heater into the rest of the house. So in a house with 10 inch thick walls, heavy duty windows, and a great air sealing package, we have a very quiet assembly. So all those little noises that that water heater might make can be a real irritating problem for clients. Therefore, we had to look for a different solution. Now, the, uh, the, the heat pump is probably the most efficient, or not probably, is the most efficient device that we can use for heating water, but we don't want it inside. So we found the Sandin CO2 uh, heat pump water heater. It comes with the outdoor, uh, it's a mini split technology. So it comes with the outdoor heating element that is an air source heat pump. Now it's coupled to all of that air outside. So we don't have any cubic air requirements. We just have a little bit of like clearance. 
So it's able to steal heat from everything outside. And then we have a stainless steel tank on the indoor unit, meaning that indoor unit is probably not ever gonna have that same, I exploded and flooded your house with water that some water heaters in the United States have been notorious for over the years. We have a high quality tank on the inside and we have a hybrid heat pump on the outside. So it's a very interesting technology. All of our water heating happens outside, which means we do have water lines on the outside of the house. We have to handle that, we have to plan for that, and we have to run a heat tape on those units. So the water goes from our city, from our municipality, into the hot water heater on the cold side, back out on the bottom, and to our unit outdoors as a cold, and then it circulates back up to the hot side of our tank. And then the reason that all that happens is the unit actually gets a higher efficiency rating operating at a higher temperature. So the unit outdoors is actually heating the water to 170 degrees or it's capable of going to 170 degrees. And when you have a unit that's putting out 170 degree water, you're not plumbing that to your devices. So it mixes with the cold to uh, handle what we have going on. So that's why it has that, that in and out feature that most water heaters don't have. So we have our heat tape on our outdoor water lines to keep them from freezing. The unit outdoors is rated to negative 20 degrees. We don't see negative 20 degree temperatures. That rating shows that that unit will still find heat in the air to steal and heat your water all the way down to negative 20 degrees. Seems counterintuitive, uh, but science is a wonderful thing. Uh, another benefit of that unit, it does not use the R134A refrigerant that's uh, bad for the environment when it leaks off like a regular uh, or, or like a common outdoor air conditioner. It uses CO2. Well, CO2 is a natural occurring element. It just has to be harvested and then put into the system. And if we have a system leak, CO2 has a global warming potential number of one. It's really not bad for the environment because it is part of the environment naturally. It also is the secret to their uh, success with the, uh, their compressor and their efficiency rating. So when we talked earlier about some heat pump water heaters get us to the 200% rating, the Sandin can get up to the 500%. Uh, and I, I believe that's at 67 degrees. So you put a dollar in and you get $5 worth of hot water back out. That is a heck of a cost savings. Uh, next, we have no noise. The only noise we have is a little bit of water running through the lines and in, in and out of the tank. So in a quiet house like this, we don't have a problem with noise. In fact, the hot water heater here upstairs adjoins the master bedroom. It's in the next room to the master bedroom and it's about six inches from that master bedroom wall. We wouldn't dare think of doing that with a gas or a heat pump water heater, traditional heat pump water heater. Another really interesting thing about this system is now, well, sorry, let's back up. That means I can put a closet door on it because no heating is actually taking place in that room. So that traditional closet like you'd see in a 50s ranch that's six feet wide and with a five foot door on it, that houses my water heater and my ERV for this house. Another interesting thing, because the unit uses such little energy, it's on a 15 amp breaker. Now it's a 230, but it is a 15 amp breaker. Talk about counterintuitive, the idea that you could have hot water from a 15 amp breaker and it be energy efficient. The whole system is designed for us to rethink as a society how we heat water. The, the systems have been in Japan for I think 20 years or maybe more. Uh, the company Sandin that makes the, the compressor outdoors, uh, they make compressors for all sorts of industries. And this just happens to be a like, hey, we have this technology, where else can we use it for them originally? Uh, but it makes a lot of sense. And I think that while the unit is more expensive than a lot of the, uh, or, or almost all of the traditional water heaters on the market in the United States, the efficiency rating and the benefits and the flexibility that you have means a lot to the industry. And I think that this could be a game changer. I can imagine clients like we have sometimes that are far enough out that they don't have uh, 
gas where you'd have to have propane delivered and yet electricity is very cheap, like seven cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, that This could be something that you would think about where, yeah, we would rather spend our money on electricity than on having propane delivered. I, I also just think that it's a really interesting technology that I think is an industry we should work to support. So. I wanted to say thanks for watching today. Look into the sand and water heater. Uh, they are really interesting and, I, and exciting, and that's why I wanted to share this. Uh, check us out every day of the week on the Build Show Network. We're putting out one video a day. We have one day, Wade Paquin, Brent Hull, Steve Basic, Matt Reisinger, they all have a day. Uh, I'm really happy that they've asked me to be involved. I think that that's a great group of guys to be involved with when it comes to building, building science, the business of what we do. So. Thanks for watching. I'm Jake Bruton. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram. That's the build show for today.